with Alan McMillan. They decided that they wanted to have um, they decided that they wanted to have rock music because they wanted to be really hip in this musical review. And there wasn't a single person involved, including Al McMillan, who knew anything about how to do a rock score. So I said, well, I'll do it. And at the time, I was co-managing a band called Icarus. Do you remember? And my, my co-managing partner was Michael Cole. Michael Cole thought that managing the band meant booking them into clubs, and I thought it meant working on their songs. So I was a manager working on their songs. <laughs> anyway, I got, what, what I did was I talked the producer and the music director into letting us put Icarus in the, in the show as the, as the band, right? The house band for the show. And I ended up doing like the arrangements and stuff for that show. And Alan McMillan finally said, you know, my partner Jack Richardson, I think could use somebody like you. I'm thinking to be a manager. I could, I could become a manager. So he said, I want to introduce you. So there, I went to meet Jack Richardson at Nimbus 9, 131 Hazleton Avenue. They had a poster in the front window that said, guess who, American woman, number one. And I went, man, this is the place. I'm in the place. So I go in there, and I sit down with Jack Richardson, and I'm just the punky, brashest 19-year-old, and I say, I'm going to be a manager for Nimbus 9. Jack goes, no, you're not. <laughs> And I say, excuse me? And he goes, that's not what you mean, kid. Like, what you mean, kid? This is really frustrating. I'm just going to talk to you. You can hear me, right? Yeah. I'm just going to talk to you. So Jack said, that's not what you mean, kid. What you really mean is you want to be a producer. And I had no idea what that meant. So, but it was a job. And I was like, okay, I'll be a producer. And, and what happened was... Uh, I guess Alan had pre-sold me, I had a good enough attitude, I presented myself well enough to Jack, he liked my energy, that he decided to take me under his wing. And this was a man who at that time was the producer of the number one band in the world. Right? In the world. So, he didn't have to do any of this, but because he as many of you grew to know, those of you that had a relationship with Jack Richardson, um, <coughs> tell me when, boys. How's that? Okay. Um, he was a large man. It takes a big heart to power a large man. And he had the biggest heart in the world. And, and, and this was a, someone who decided he believed in me. And, and he, because he believed in me, and because he had such a generosity of spirit, he decided he was going to train me and give me opportunities. I ended up um, being glued to Jack Richardson's side, almost, almost literally. Wherever he went, I went. And I was the, I was the, um, I was the advance man, meaning if he was going to produce a band out of, like we, we produced this band called The Chosen Few, from Muncie, Indiana, who had to change the name because there was a chosen few in every city in the world. So, but anyway, we went to Muncie, Indiana to work with these guys, and I had to do the rehearsals and work up their material. Then Jack came, and Jack would produce. So when Jack was there, I stayed right beside him, watched everything he did, listened to everything he did. And after the band left, Jack and I on the, in the cab back to the hotel, I'd have my little notebook, and I'd go, Jack, Jack, what, what did you mean when you said this? And then we'd get to the studio, we, he liked to record in Chicago. Jack loved RCA Mid-America Studios in Chicago. So we would fly from Toronto to Chicago on a Monday to work until Friday night, then Saturday we'd go back. Sometimes we wouldn't go back, as Shirley would say. Right? He knew because Jack was missing from home a lot because he was working in the States all the time. But on those flights, I'd have my little notebook and I'd go, okay, condenser microphone. Jack, what is a condenser microphone and why? And he would draw little diagrams for me and explain it to me. It was like the greatest education a kid could have. So that when I turned 20, and uh, Jack sent me to the Eastman School of Music, I'd been working for him for, I don't know, two months maybe. They had me doing jingles, they had me doing all kinds of stuff. They sent me to the Eastman School of Music for a two-week production course uh, engineering and production course with a guy named Phil Ramon. How many people here know who that is? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Phil Ramone and David Green, who lit, who still lives here, right? Yes, David Green, an amazing engineer. Those two guys. So I showed up, and because I came from Jack, for whom they had a tremendous amount of respect, they at least gave me the time of day. They they let me at least speak once, and then they liked what they heard, and then they took me under their wings for two weeks. These guys were like available to me. And I got more time on the console than anybody. Because why? Because I didn't sleep. Because every waking minute of the day, I was either getting information or I had my hands on the board. And then I got back to this to uh, Nimbus after that. And Alice Cooper's manager walked in the door and said, "I want you to Jack. I want you to produce Alice Cooper." Now Jack Richardson was a very straight ex. A ex advertising executive, guy who wore a suit and a tie, literally, to produce rock music. This is before Jack got groovy, right? He was still pretty, he was, Jack was still pretty straight. So when he saw the original pictures of Alice Cooper from Easy Action of Pretty Free, he looked at these five creatures of indeterminate sex with wearing dresses and braided mutton chops and makeup. He was like, can we swear in this room? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Are you sure? No yes. fucking way. He would look at it. He just looked at this, and, and Jack never swore either at that time. It started later. No fucking way. So he looked at me and he goes, "Get rid of him." And my job was to get rid of Alice Cooper. That was the thing. So, so then they kept bothering him and bothering him, and he, and, and and in the time honored. Uh, tradition of any mentor, what do you do when someone's bugging the shit out of you? You throw the kid under the bus. That's what you do. <laughs> so Jack said, all right, I'll have the kid take a look at the band. If the kid likes them, then I'll take a look at the band. So then they started bothering me. And, and my job was to get rid of them. I didn't know how to do this. So finally I got sent to New York City. It's a long story, but I'll just cut to the chase. So went to see them play at Max's Kansas City, a midnight show on the 8th of September, 1970. I will never forget it. And, and, uh, and this show was unbelievable. They were like, first of all, walking into the club, it was like walking into a Hieronymus Bosch painting. Everybody had spider eyes and spandex and they had jet black hair and jet black lipstick and black fingernails and, and they all knew all the words to all the songs. And then they had sets of props and amazing lighting and then they had a big pillow fight and there were feathers all over the place. It was unbelievable and they actually even had a couple of songs that I liked and it just was, it was an amazing, it was, a, and I'm just a hippie kid from Toronto, you know, and I'm watching all this stuff goes down. I was with a friend of mine and, and after the show was over, I looked at him and I was like, what was that? He goes, I don't know, but I think I liked it. And I said, well, I fucking loved it. So I went running up the stairs to the dressing room of Max's Kansas City, and I burst into the dressing room and went, we'll do it! <laughs> we will do it! Because I think you guys can make hit records. And they go, well, we think you guys can too. I said, yes, we can. And we'll do it for you. We will do it. And they go, great, when do we start? I said, I'll get back to you immediately. And then I go out in the street and I go, I am so fired. <laughs> Which I was. And I called Alan McMillan on the phone in the morning and he said, you, you are so fired. Get your ass back here immediately. And so I did and I came in. I, I, I got off a plane in the cab. I'm rehearsing what I'm going to say and everything. And then I, I come up the front steps of... The, of the office and I go right into Jack's office which is right to the right of the front door as you come in and I go in and my, the first words out of my mouth are you don't understand <laughs> you know as every teenager will say you know I was only that far out of my teenage I go you don't understand this wasn't rock and roll there were no t-shirts there were no jeans they had sets and they had lights and props and everybody had spandex and spiders it was amazing they knew all the words it was like fantastic and the lights would go up and down and all you know I was just talking and talking I actually got up on his desk I got on his desk and I was going, but Jack, this was not rock and roll. This is the beginning of a cultural movement, I said. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he goes, all right, you like him so damn much, you do it. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my career. <laughs> I think the, uh, my favorite part of that story that you left there was coming face to face with Alice Cooper in the dark with a hammer in his hand yeah, well, and thinking he was going to club you on stage. But, yes, yes I did. But the most important part of all of that is somebody believed in me. 
I found somebody who believed in me. And, and that person gave me the knowledge and the room to grow and, and the support and even the, the vote of confidence to look at me. I mean, our nuts were on the line, you know. It would be a Nimbus 9 production, whether I did it or he did it. And he goes, you like it so much, you do it. That's unbelievable. And, and, and if I hadn't had that, I don't know whether I'd be doing this now. And I, I don't know whether, you know, I would have found another way in. The one important lesson from all of that is that if you have that opening, even if it's a sliver of an opening, you go through it with everything you have. Don't sleep. Don't stop. Ask all the questions you can. Most importantly, instill confidence in that person who is giving you that break. If they are confident in you, then they will open all kinds of doors for you. And the, and the ancillary lesson is that those of us in this room who have a platform and the ability to do that for others, we have an obligation to do it. So we started a school, but aside from the school, we've both had people that we've worked with that we have, that we have mentored and brought through the system and given the same kind of breaks that we had when we first started. You mentioned that uh, Jack had a belief in you, Bob. Um, and now here you are in a position where you know people will approach you and, and, and give you their demos. What and, and, and each of the producers on the panel can answer to this. But what what is it about an artist that makes you want to work with them? Is it is it their their songwriting first and foremost? Is it their is it their ambition, their desire to succeed? Is it is it the full package? What, what as a producer makes you want to work with a particular songwriter? Um, by the way, I want to point out. Good call. Well spotted. You didn't wait for it to completely go off. You have another mic being prepared right here because we heard a little. Give it up for Greg. Yeah, give it up for Greg. Um, well, put it. I I uh, judged the Battle of Bands last night, the Jacks Battle of Bands, and I'm so excited to work with the band that won last night because they were 17 year old kids and they just. Dominated. It was the third show ever, and all four judges stood up and just on our feet the entire set. And they just, it was, I don't know, it was amazing to see young guys that just, they're just passionate about it, and they're rock stars, and they're 17. So for me, it's just the, you could see it in them, and they were all excited, and just the excitement, and obviously there was big rock guitars and rock drums, and I'm a rock fan, so it connected with me musically, but it was just the energy and excitement in, in these guys, for me, that that's that was awesome to see. So and usually that's what it is, something like musically or whatever that hits me and gets me excited. So, Dan, what is it about a... I think it changes every time. Sometimes you don't even know what it is. There's just something about somebody. I, I know no different than if you people are attracted to somebody physically or whatever and somebody else might not be. I don't know what it is. I, I, sometimes it's the song, sometimes it's the singing, sometimes it's all of it, sometimes it's just somebody's presence. Hopefully it's all of those things. But um, I, you look at who's become popular over the years. There's If there was one thing, everybody be the same. Well, there's a lot of the same now, but you know. Um, it, it's very, 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 uh, it's hard to define, honestly. Some, it, it's, it's intangible to me. You just kind of know what that is. That was asked yesterday to Garth. Somebody asked, how did you know to do that thing with the wine glasses? How did you know to do that? What, where'd that thing come from? Where'd that thing come from? It's just gut, I would say. Yeah. You have to say songs. You have to have a singer that's a star. Because if someone that's up on stage and he's actually boring and there's no, you know, there's no vibe, then it's just not gonna work. So it's always the song. The song comes, the, the song comes first. <laughs> and the message, I, I, if it speaks to me on whatever level, like, like Dan said, what, if it speaks to me and says something different, I, or if I notice it, if it goes on my radar, because there's lots of stuff I think that just uh, you hear and it's like, oh, that might sell a lot, or someone might buy shampoo because of that, or whatever, whatever, whatever thing everyone else goes about it, that's for them. But if it, if it speaks to you, and you think there are other people like you out there, then maybe it will speak to them as well. You can help uh, be the conduit for that message. 
I, I look for connection. I look for somebody who has a, um, who's found an inner voice tapped into what they what a lot of people call the fractals of the universe, the underwriting deep message, and uh, that sings to the soul. Because I think what the business that we're in is a soul food business. Our job as create creators of music is to have people have soul food. And why do people are constantly coming back to music? A multi-dimensional art form that crosses all barriers of language it's because it feeds our soul and when it feeds your soul and then somebody when you find somebody who knows how to use that language and quite often it's the song but performance as well when they speak that language you just know it and all of a sudden that it, in, it in, um, empowers everybody and, it's, and it's, it's compelling you just want to be a part of that Bob what is it about an artist that uh, would make you want to work with them uh, well, I think it, you know, most of it's been touched on here. Um, but I think, for me, the most important thing is that there has to be an absolute... I'll tell you a story. best way to answer this is to tell you a story. So my daughter was, uh, was a junior executive, uh, a creative exec in a movie company in L.A. because we were living in L.A. and she had gotten a job in the film business by accident, worked her way up to being a junior creative exec, working for... A guy like the like the one in Swimming Swimming with Sharks. Has anybody seen that movie? Or or The Devil Wears Prada. You know, she had that boss. That's that kind of a boss. And one night she called me because she would every night she would call me in tears. And one night she called me and said, um, "I'm thinking of quitting. Is this the worst uh, decision that I've ever made?" And I said, "Let me ask you a question. Would you die if you didn't make a movie?" And she thought about it for. 30 seconds, and she said, I'd be deeply disappointed, but I wouldn't die. So I said, then you have to quit. Because there's two kinds of people in the world. There are people who work to achieve something, whether it's make money, security for their family, fame, fortune, whatever it is they work for. Those people work for a goal, and they, they get to choose how they get there, or how they try to get there. And then there's this other group of people who are born with a calling and they have no choice. Those people, if they don't do what they were born to do, will die. And sometimes they die doing what they were born to do because it's so compelling and overriding of everything else that it fucks up their life and, and, and hurts them. But so when you say, what am I looking for in my thing? I think I've been pretty consistent in only going for the people in group two. That's, that's what I look for. Yeah. And so, and conversely to that though, what, um, you know, what should uh, artists be looking for in a producer? What, what is like the, the main selling point of a producer that would make a producer attractive to a, a singer songwriter or a band. somebody that, that would be like a father to them, somebody that would be like actual guidance counselor, somebody that'll help them to them hold their hand, help them find out who they are, you know, you know, hunt down these walls, make them feel, you know. Dan, you want to weigh in on that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> acknowledge exactly what he said. Um, um, musically, I think a lot of people can connect with somebody. Um, it's, def it's definitely different to get somebody to open up in front of you, make you feel safe. I always say in talking to students, especially about recording a vocalist, that you have to, you know those things, who here sings? If you sing, you'll do things alone you won't do when other people are, that sounds wrong. Um, <laughs> You understand what I mean? You'd sing in the car, or you'd do things and think, thank God nobody heard that crap. You know, that was, that was right? But then you'll try it out on your band, and then you'll go, um, yeah, that's just something I've just threw up the top of my head. <laughs> but you've been working on it for a while. Um, those, you need to make somebody feel comfortable enough that they are doing that in front of you. You're not even there, or we can both laugh together if it's a little bit funny, uh, if they, somebody does something odd. There, and it has to happen very quick. You don't have much time to gain somebody's um, trust. The trust is, I think, would be the biggest thing. And I think you'll know that right away. A band artist would know that right from somebody. If you've got a used car salesman vibe, you know, I don't, I don't think that would work. <laughs> Aaron, these guys, what they've just said, it, yeah, the, you're obviously you got to someone you got to be comfortable with, and so, yeah, they, they already said it. 
With uh, with respect to um, you know giving industry tips here, we talk about what what uh, a producer might look for in an artist, or what an artist might look for in a producer. Bob, I saw you uh, you interviewed um, uh, a while ago, and uh, you had, you were part of a music panel, and a number of people had given you their demos, and there was one band in particular that you really liked, but then you pointed out on stage you had no way of getting in touch with them if yeah if. Well, that what, was what's, 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 a, I was what's actually, like a big no-no? Uh, I, I, I wasn't trying to be uh, rude here. I was looking for... Because um, Ian Pace just did an interview about the last uh, Deep Purple album that we did together. And he was... He actually said... It, it, well, I can't find it, unfortunately. But he said the greatest things about what it was that, that he needed in a producer. Right? And he said, it's hard enough to just play. It's hard enough to just be me and in the studio. I don't want to have to think about anything else. And he said, and I need somebody that I can trust, as, as you were saying, to make the right decisions, to put me in the right position, to make it possible for me to succeed, and to decide when I have, right? Because I'm too close to it. I may not be the right person. Um, I may not be the right person to judge my own work. So I think that, that now, as, as you were saying, th th it, it happens pretty quick. We get like one meeting or something like that. How do you how do you um, how do you convey that? How do you personify that when you're in a room with somebody who's never met you before, is nervous as hell.